My name is Derek Atkins, and this video is for the Theology 2 course at the East Asia School of Theology. This video lecture is on the origins of human life. Where do we come from? For thousands of years, humans have been asking this question. In fact, this is one of the great questions of life because how we answer this question has an enormous influence on how we look at the world, how we answer the question, who am I, and on how we live our lives. Throughout history, People have answered the question, where did I come from, in many different ways. But during the past two centuries, Darwinian evolution has become the dominant explanation for human origin in many parts of the world. In many schools around the world, the Darwinian model is taught as fact, with students memorizing the names of hominid fossils such as Homo erectus, Homo afarensis, Homo habilis, Pro Manion, and Neanderthal. And in these presentations, absolutely no mention is made of the possibility of divine origin for humans. But is this really how we came into existence? Are we simply advanced, thinking, careless apes? On the other hand, the Bible clearly teaches that God created humans in his image. Even Jesus affirmed that God created us in the beginning. For example, Genesis 2-7 says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In today's world, we often see a conflict between evolution and creation. And this is a question that many people have struggled with, including many Christians. Some Christians have tried to reconcile evolution with the biblical account while other Christians emphasize the difference between the Bible's teaching about creation and Darwinian evolution. Today, we're going to explore this question. We'll look at what the theory of evolution is, then we'll examine the strengths and weaknesses of the evolutionary explanation for human origin. We'll then turn our focus to the Christian understanding of divine creation and examine the strengths and weaknesses of creationism. We'll wrap up our session on human origin by discussing how we can deal with this question when witnessing to non-Christians. So now let's talk about the naturalist theory of evolution. This viewpoint has had some very famous advocates, including Carl Sagan from Cornell University, Stephen J. Gould from Harvard University, Richard Dawkins from Oxford University, Richard Roos, whose specialty is the philosophy of science, and many, many others. What, but what exactly does the naturalist theory of evolution claim. Well, this slide gives us some information on the, what the naturalist theory of evolution is. Biological evolution refers to the changes over time that occur in living organisms. Biological evolution is defined as descent with modification. Biological evolution also includes the idea that all of life is connected and can be traced back to one common ancestor. 
to continue, according to the theory of evolution, life changed over billions of years through non-directed chance. Notice that phrase, non-directed chance. This means that those changes that help a species to survive are passed down to future generations, while those changes that do not help a species to survive are not passed down to future generations. This process is known as natural selection. And non-directed chance means there is no intelligent agency involved in the process of natural selection. It's just blind luck that's involved. Now, there is a big assumption that lies behind evolution. And that assumption is that the very first living cells originally came from inorganic material. That is, the very first living cells came from non-living things. This raises a huge question for evolution. And that question is, how did life come from lifelessness? How did living things come from non-living things? <clears throat> The process of life starting from lifeless things is a huge problem because evolution really isn't able to answer this question. The theory of evolution is usually associated with Charles Darwin in some form or other. Although there were some people who proposed evolutionary ideas earlier, Charles Darwin is credited with creating a coherent theory of evolution and using evidence gathered from his long study of nature to support his theory. Charles Darwin grew up as the son of an English pastor and began developing his theory of evolution during his voyage on the HMS Beagle. He, um, he went on this voyage literally around the world. And during this voyage, he observed, um, he had the opportunity to observe many different animals in many different places around the world. And of special importance for Darwin was the time he spent on the Galapagos Islands, which are located just west of South America, where he observed many different animals. And so during his time on the Galapagos Islands, he observed changes in these animals and theorized that animals change in response to changes in their environment. Now, let's look at some suggested evidence for evolution. The first bit of suggested evidence for evolution is the fossil record. Evolutionists claim that the fossil record supports the idea of gradual evolutionary change. Especially important in this respect is hominid or human fossil record, horse evolution and bird to reptile or archaeopteryx evolution. So this is the first bit of suggested evidence for evolution. The next bit of suggested evidence for evolution is the age of the universe. Um, the universe is said to be very old. And the reason why um, many scientists say this is because we, we can see galaxies that are millions and even billions of light years away, which mean, and, and a light year is the, the distance that it takes light to travel in one year. So that's why it's known as a light year. 
Therefore, scientists say since these galaxies are millions and even billions of light years away, that means it took light millions and billions of years to reach us. Therefore, the universe is billions and billions of years old. In fact, the latest figure is 13.8 billion years old. Now, the reason why this is presented as evidence for evolution is because evolutionists say that this long period of time, nearly 14 billion years, gave gives evolution enough time to work its magic. In other words, there are long enough periods of time for evolution for um, organisms to evolve from simple cell, single cell organisms all the way to the many, many different animals, plants, et cetera, that we see today. So this is the second bit of evidence for evolution that evolutionists propose. Another uh, suggested evidence for evolution is the observation of microevolution in nature. Um, observation of speciation, which is microevolution or adaptation, is often considered proof for the fact that transspeciation, macroevolution must occur. Um, so let me just um, clarify here. Microevolution refers to evolution within a single species. And we see that all the time. For example, microevolution is the reason why we have many different breeds of cats or many different breeds of dogs or different kinds of horses, et cetera. Macroevolution, on the other hand, is change is when animals change from one species to an entirely different species altogether. Okay. So um, microevolution is suggested as proof of macroevolution. And um, one commonly cited example of this are Darwin's finches. Now, Darwin observed finches um, during his time on the Galapagos Islands, and he noticed that different finches have different beaks. And so he theorized that these beaks evolved over time. And so this, so um, many people today would say this is evidence of microevolution. And then evolutionists would go on to say that this evidence of microevolution points to macroevolution. So this is another um, bit of evidence that is suggested that supports the theory of evolution. Um, now, the occurrence of favorable mutation in reproduction along with adaptation is claimed to be a mechanism to bring about long-term gradual changes in expressed traits which are selected by environment for their survival quotient, which is called natural selection. And that's the link between microevolution and macroevolution. Thus, evolutionary change occurs on the basis of time plus non-directed chance plus mutation plus survivability of certain traits in response to certain external environments. And so this whole process has been popularly known as the survival of the fittest. Okay. So let's look at another suggested bit of bit of suggested evidence for 
evolution. And those are observations in genetics. Here, geneticists have observed certain genetic inheritances that seem to have been passed down through time through various families of animals and species. Um, for an explanation of these, see Francis Collins' The Language of God. Um, Francis, now I want to point out that Francis Collins fully embraces Darwinian, Darwinian evolution, but he argues that biological evolution is the tool that God used to create humans. And so Francis Collins is an example of a Christian who tries to um, find some way to combine evolution and creation, arguing that God created the world, but that evolution was the tool that he used for creating the world. Now, biologist Douglas Futuma summarizes the profound importance of the idea of evolution and its impact on all scientific thought since Charles Darwin in this way. This is his quote from Douglas Futuma. By coupling undirected, purposeless variation to the blind, uncaring process of natural selection, Darwin made theological or spiritual explanation of the life processes superfluous. Together with Marx's materialistic theory of history and society and Freud's attribution of human behavior to influences over which we have little control Darwin's theory of evolution was a crucial plank in the platform of mechanism and materialism, of much of science in short, that has since been the stage of most Western thought. Okay. So this is the impact of Darwinism. And what this, what, um, Douglas Petuma is saying is that together with Karl Marx's um, economic theories and Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution has helped to create the, the world that we live in today, where God and the supernatural are considered um, meaningless. So this is part of the impact that Darwinism has had on our world. So let's look at some assumptions that underlie evolution, okay? One of the assumptions that underlies evolution is that naturalistic evolution is an established fact, okay? Now, when I was in college, my biology professor treated naturalistic evolution as an established fact. He explained that scientists and non-scientists have different definitions for the word theory, okay? This is very important. Whereas most non-scientists think of a theory as a proposed idea that hasn't yet been proven, scientists treat theories as fact, because they argue that theories are explanations that best fit all the known facts. Scientists therefore treat scientific theories as established facts. Okay, now you might say, but science is constantly changing. And that's true. Because what happens in science is as new evidence comes to light, current scientific theories will change and they will change to fit the new facts. But according to scientists, 
that still does not mean that a scientific theory is unproven. It simply means that a scientific theory fits all present known facts. So yes, a scientific theory may be changed or proven wrong in the future by new facts, but at the present time, a certain, a particular scientific theory fits all known facts, and therefore, scientists accept a scientific any scientific theory as established fact. Thus, if evolution is a fact, then we should we could not have come about through any other means other than by an evolutionary process of time plus chance plus mutation, okay? So this is one of the underlying assumptions behind evolution. And that is the assumption that naturalistic evolution is an established fact. And this is partly based on the scientific understanding of what a theory is. Here is another assumption that underlies evolution. Matter and energy are eternal. In addition to the problem of how non-living things could produce living things, naturalistic evolution is unable to explain how the universe itself came into existence. Scientists agree that the Big Bang happened, but they cannot explain how or why the Big Bang happened. Some scientists argue that our universe came from a previous universe that went through a big crunch that then produced our Big Bang. And this is the oscillating universe theory. So this picture on this slide illustrates the oscillating universe theory. So it says that our universe that our universe began with a big bang. It is expanding and then eventually gravity will cause our universe to uh, contract until we come to the big crunch. And the oscillating universe theory says that our universe is only one in a series of many universes that have gone through this process of starting out with a big bang, expanding, then contracting, and have and to a big crunch. And then once that universe, and so the oscillating universe theory says that our universe began with the big bang, it, it is expanding, it will then contract, and then we will have a big crunch. And then after the big crunch, that will produce the um, ignition for another Big Bang, which will lead to another universe. And that universe will then expand, contract, have another big crunch, which will then become the ignition for yet another universe. And so this is how some scientists try to explain the origin of our universe. But this, this, the oscillate, the, but there is a problem with the oscillating universe model. And that is with the oscillating universe, you're only pushing back the problem. Because if you say that our universe was started by a previous universe, well, then where did that previous universe come from? Scientists might support this theory would say, oh, that universe came from another previous universe. Well, then where did that previous universe come from? And it just goes, and you're just simply pushing the problem back um, infinite, infinite regression. But you still haven't answered the question, where did that very first universe come from, okay? So this is the problem with the oscillating universe model. Now, 
many scientists simply don't try to explain where everything came from, but assume, like Carl Sagan did, that the universe is eternal and has always existed. For example, consider the very first word in Carl Sagan's book, Cosmos. The cosmos is all there is, all there ever was, and all there, wa there ever will be. If this statement sounds religious, that's because it is. It's a statement of faith, and it's not based upon any observable facts. Like Carl Sagan, scientists who hold this view simply assume it to be true without any evidence to back it up. Now, scientists will say they have evidence to back it up, but ultimately, they cannot prove this statement. This assumption leads to the belief that there is no supernatural reality since energy and matter are the only things that exist in the universe. This assumption also leads to the idea that our universe is incredibly old, as in 13.8 billion years old, and is really eternal. Now, here's another assumption that underlies evolution. And that assumption is that humans are nothing more than a complex combination of biological and physiological processes. During the past few decades, many scientists have been comparing humans to computers and other machines. In fact, many science fiction novels and movies explore this question from many different angles, as artificial intelligence mechanical processes, and wearable technology continue to advance, we can expect to see the line between humans and machines to become increasingly blurred. And this feeds into this assumption that humans are nothing more than a complex combination of biological and physiological processes. Now, here's another assumption that underlies evolution. And that is the assumption that God does not exist. Or if he does, he is uninvolved and uninterested in life on earth. Now, this, this belief Okay, so this, this assumption covers two different belief systems. The first is atheism, which is that there is no God. And the second belief that this assumption covers is something called deism. Now, deism was very common in Europe and in North America about 200 to 250 years ago. Um, in fact, many of the founding fathers of the United States were, in fact, deists. And so deism says that God created the universe, he set it into motion, kind of like winding up a clock and setting the clock into motion, but then God walked away, and he is no longer involved in the running of the universe. So this is another assumption that underlies evolution. Either God does not exist, or if he does, he is no longer involved in the workings of our universe. Now, there are a number of problems with evolution. And the first of these is the question, um, where did everything come from? Now, many years ago, I struggled with the question of evolution and creation. For example, during my middle school years, 
I wrote an essay in which I used the day age theory to reconcile the claims of evolution with the Genesis account. In other words, I said, well, each day in the Genesis account was actually actually represent millions of years of evolution. So this is this was an issue that I struggled with for many years. Um, however, about 20 years ago, my thinking changed and I became a firm believer in creation. This change happened because I came to realize that there are serious problems with evolution. And once I saw that there are serious problems with evolution, I then began, began to fully embrace the biblical account of creation. So let's take a moment to look at what some of these problems with evolution are. So the first problem, as I mentioned, is the question, where did everything come from? In other words, where did all, where did the raw materials for our universe come from? We touched on this question earlier and saw that scientists try to use the oscillating universe model to explain where our universe came from. The latest explanation among scientists for the existence of our universe comes from the world of quantum physics. According to these scientists, our universe popped into existence because of the of fluctuations in the quantum field. In other words, many scientists are now arguing that nothing is not nothing. Nothing is something, namely a quantum field. Um, and this again reflects the idea that energy and matter are eternal. But this idea that the universe popped into existence from a from some quantum field uh, begs the same question as the oscillating universe model. Where did the quantum field come from? Where did energy and matter come from in the first place? The fact that the fact of the matter is that the claim that there is no God suffers severely from a lack of viable intellectual and scientific support. Okay, here's another problem with the theory of evolution. Is evolutionary theory really testable? In other words, are, is it um, given the fact that microevolution can really jump? Given the fact of microevolution, can we really jump from microevolution to the idea of macroevolution? Since we cannot, we have not, and cannot observe or test such an event in real life. Now, here's the thing. Science is supposed to be carried out by means of the scientific method in which scientists test their hypotheses through observation and experiment. But with the theory of evolution, there is no really, there's no way to really test it. At best, scientists can only observe fossil remains. But that leads us to the next problem. And that is the fossil record is far from supportive of evolutionary theory. Contrary to popular belief, the fossil record is far from complete. Darwin actually knew this and thought that the fossil record was made more complete as, and thought that as the fossil record was made more complete, transitional forms would appear. In other words, Charles Darwin had enough faith in evolution that he believed that uh, further scientific discoveries would, 
would bring to life more fossils that would bring positive confirmation to the theory of evolution. Now, more than 160 years after the publication of Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, this claim is no longer sustainable. Along these lines, listen to what the evolutionary paleontologist Niles Eldridge has to say. Each new generation, it seems, produces a few young paleontologists eager to document examples of evolutionary change in their fossils. More often than not, their efforts have gone unrewarded. Their fossils, rather than exhibiting the, the expected pattern, just seem to persist virtually unchanged. This extraordinary conservatism looked to the paleontologist keen on finding evolutionary change as if no evolution had occurred. Thus, such studies were considered failures and more often than not, were not even published. But insofar as evolution itself is concerned, paleontologists usually saw stasis as no result rather than as a contradiction of the prediction of gradual progressive evolutionary change. Very damning words indeed. Consider also these quotes from two more evolutionary thinkers. This is L. Denoy from Human Destiny. In brief, each group order or family seems to be born suddenly and we hardly ever find the forms which link them to the preceding strain. When we discover them, they are already completely differentiated. Not only do we find practically no transitional form, but in general, it is impossible to authentically connect a new group with an ancient one. And this next quote comes from G.G. G. Simpson. This regular absence of transitional form is not confined to mammals, but is an almost universal phenomenon as, as has long been noted by paleontologists. It is true of almost all orders of all classes of animals, both, both vertebrate and invertebrate. A fortiori, it is also true of the classes and of the major animal phyla, and is apparently also true of analogous categories of plants. And to think, that some of these very same scientists are guilty of accusing Christians of being closed-minded to facts. In addition, there are other problems as well. Several things found in the fossil record point to a universal flood and other rapid processes of change. For example, paleontologists have found the complete fossil of a whale that extends through strata that supposedly covers millions of years of evolutionary fossil history. In addition, some so-called living fossils like the pelican, a which is a quote primitive fish, and the tuatara, another a quote primitive reptile, completely disappear in the evolutionary fossil for millions of years, but are still alive, essentially unchanged today. Evolutionary biologists are hard pressed to explain such major anomalies and usually ignore them altogether. For some of the, 
for some of these more embarrassing evidences and direct admissions of problems like the one I quoted above against evolution, see the helpful but now somewhat dated The Genesis Flood by Henry Morris and John Whitcomb, and especially Duane Gish's excellent book, Evolution, The Challenge of the Fossil Record. Now, um, we're, this first video lecture is coming to an end. So I want, I ask you to please go to part two of this video lecture.